Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us at PancakesCon 2. We are about to get started. Thank you for tuning into our streams today, um, March 21st, 2021. I'm happy that you're all here joining us. I hope that you have a wonderful day today. And who am I? My name is Leslie Carhart. I am the founder of PancakesCon, and I want to welcome you all back to our second year. Now, when I started this conference a year ago, the first week of quarantine for a lot of us as an emergency stopgap to keep everybody occupied, I did not think that we were going to be back here this year doing this again. But here we are. So the theme of PancakesCon 2 this year is persevere. And perseverance means to hang the heck in there. So we're doing this conference again to bring everybody together, to lift everybody's spirits, because we just have to hang in there a little bit longer. And yes, it's been a very strange year for all of us. Um, a lot of people have faced loss, um, a lot of trauma, a lot of tragedy. And I wish I could take that away from every one of you. I wish that I could make your 2020 and your 2021 much better than they were. Um, but I want to say how thankful I am that you're all still here. You're all watching this, this uh, stream, that we're all together, and that we're all still part of the InfoSec and the hacker communities. And uh, yes, it's been weird. I haven't had a haircut since we saw each other last. Um, I'm sure some of you haven't either, but it, it doesn't matter. We're going to persevere. We're going to make it through this. And uh, we're, we're going to have a better 2021, folks. We're, we're going to do this together uh, as a community. And um, we're not going to forget the people that we've lost. And we're not going to forget the things that we've learned in this, this trying, difficult year. I want to start out with some thanks. So there's a lot of people to thank this year. So first of all, I want to thank my co-organizers who have put hours and hours and hours and hours into making this conference go. So Munin, Corinne, Angela, Ray, and Tom, thank you so much for everything you've done at the last minute in the middle of the night to make PancakesCon possible and, and effective. Um, our village organizers, we have a bunch of villages this year. Holy cow. Um, we have a resume village organized by Chad. Um, so I know a lot of you have signed up for that and you're participating in it and that's super duper exciting. Um, they, and then we have our car hacking village, which is of course run by car hacking village. They told me yesterday that, that uh, last year we were their first virtual con and maybe the, the first instance of like a virtual hacking village. Uh, so that's really, really excited to have, exciting to have them back. I hope a lot of you enjoyed that. Um, we also now have a hardware hacking village that's run by Blenster. So thank you for doing that. And then we have these crews of volunteers, everybody. It's really, really phenomenal group of people. We have logistics volunteers who are getting people from point A to point B and making the conference go. Uh, we have a bunch of volunteers in our villages who will be helping out with those. And we have a amazing AV crew who are, are making me appear hopefully on your screen right now um, and on YouTube to, to hundreds or thousands of people across the world. So thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you to Security Innovation for providing our Capture the Flag. Uh, thank you to INE for sponsoring prizes for the winners. So some fabulous prizes for, prizes for our CTF winners. And thank you for uh, our raffle sponsor, PancakeBot. And PancakeBot makes um, 3D printers that print pancakes. They're, they're pretty, pretty neat. So we have a raffle running in conference chat right now for those. Um, so without all of those organizations and people, this conference would not be running today. Thank you to all of them. Give them a, a, a emoji round of applause, please. So, so thank you so much to all of them for, for being part of this and for making this work. So some housekeeping notes before we get rolling. So participating in the conference. Yes, if you're watching on YouTube right now, that is perfectly adequate. You can certainly sit there and stream the streams to your TV or your tablet or whatever you want all day, and that's fine. If you would like to participate in the conference, however, uh, we have a Slack instance, and it is linked on pancakescon.com at the top of the screen. And if you want to ask questions of the speakers, if you want to communicate with them, if you want to network, if you want to participate in the villages or the CTF, you need to be in the Slack channel. 
um, appropriate for that thing. So make sure that you register for the Slack and you're in the appropriate channels. If you wanna talk about track one, then be in the track one channel. Um, if you wanna talk about track two, please be in the track two channel. Our moderators will be there to get you to the right channel if you're not talking about the right things and the right ones. So bear with them, please. We're just trying to, we have, we have almost 2000 people in the Slack right now. So we need to keep things a little bit organized. Code of conduct, we have one. And uh, this is my party, and if you don't follow it, I will kick you out of the conference. It's very simple, it's very straightforward, it is linked on our website. Please familiarize yourself with it if you're not already. Um, it's very simple, uh, don't be a jerk, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we will boot people out of the conference, though, if, if you are horrible jerks. Uh, village registration. Um, Resume Village has a few openings for walk-ins this afternoon. Uh, contact Chad, Chad Salisi. Uh, I, I think it would be helpful if he would introduce himself in conference chat so you can DM him. Um, otherwise, for the other villages, uh, those are pretty simple to just join the channels for and, and, and participate in. So Hardware Hacking Village, uh, Car Hacking Village, the CTF, etc. Um, CTF registration, again, you need to be in the Slack and you need to have registered in the CTF. So the instructions are all in the CTF 2021 channel. Awards and raffle. At the end of the day, I will be providing some awards to the CTF winners. We have a nice trophy to give out. We have a bunch of sponsored prizes that are really fabulous. And also uh, there will be raffle winners for the pancake box. So there's actually, I believe, three pancake bots that will be raffled off. So you need to have entered the raffle to win. Obviously, that's in the Slack channel again. Um, yeah, so that's about all that I have. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker is Phil Wiley, who is many, many, many things, including a cybersecurity instructor, a practitioner, a red teamer. Um, he is a founder of the Pwn School Project and co-authored a book, The Pen Tester Blueprint, Starting a Career as an Ethical Hacker. Um, he's involved in Innocent Lives Foundation. He's also involved in Hacking is Not a Crime, and he once wrestled a bear. Phil, thank you so much for joining us today. It's thrilling to have you here. I'm super excited for your talk. And uh, without further ado, I think that we should let you get rolling. Well, thanks. Let me share my screen here. Thanks for that introduction, Leslie. It's an honor to be here. And thanks everyone for joining. This is my very first keynote and an honor to be chose, chosen to do the keynote by my friend, Leslie, who I really respect and have followed in the industry. And like I said, highly respect. So thanks everyone for joining. I really love the theme this year. I think this is a good theme uh, that resonates with all of us. Thanks to these virtual conferences like this has given us something to do, you know, otherwise, what would we be doing with all the the conferences canceled, all the different cybersecurity meetups? What would we do in our spare time? I am, I know we would be really bored. So fortunately, uh, this was one of the things I had to keep me sane in 2020 and continues in 2021. So uh, great to be here. So my topics today is pen testing experience and how to get it and health hacking. So Leslie introduced me, but this is just kind of a, a little overview of me. Uh, my certifications are the CISSP, OSCP, and the SANS GWAPT certification. And just kind of a little, you know, advice or input on the certification. You don't necessarily have to be certified to be a pen tester, although it does help. It's better to have than not to have, just like degrees, you know, some Companies are not requiring a four-year degree now, but you know, still it's good. To, it's good to have. So it just depends on you, the company you're interviewing with. So uh, helping people get started in pen testing is kind of one of my specialties. And you know, I, this really started prior to me becoming a teacher because I teach uh, ethical hacking at Dallas College. Been doing that for three years as of January. And so prior to that, I was sharing information with people, mentoring people, helping people get started as pen testers. So this is kind of one of my one of my specialties over my career in my life. I'm a I'm a competitive power lifter and I've always been kind of competitive. I've worked in sales and always tried to be, you know, have the top sales was always competitive and stuff. And then, you know, as you get older, it's kind of harder to compete in powerlifting. I used to compete in the open division, competing against any age group, 
And one of the my favorite competitions, which I won in 2007, was the Drug Free World Championships of powerlifting. And my competitor was like 10 years younger than me, and he saw my age. And he says, wow, you look good for your age. So it made it even more of a thrill to beat him in the competition. So all that competitiveness over the years and stuff was just kind of really driving me. And it's hard to keep up, you know, as you get older, it's hard to stay up late learning different hacking techniques. You know, it gets more difficult as you get older to do things. So I kind of realized with powerlifting, I compete in my age group. And then, you know, I realized that the world needs coaches and mentors. You know, sometimes this is an area that people overlook. You know, everyone wants to be the rock star, the, the ninja hacker, but I just kind of settled in with, this is my strength and this is the area that's needed to help others get started. And so this is one of my passions. I love speaking at conferences about becoming a pen tester. This is how my pen tester blueprint book came about. It was the inspiration of that book. It started out as a lecture the first day of my class. Uh, I basically outlined to students, you know, what a pen tester was and how to become a pen tester. Some of the other professors in the college I taught at or teach at asked me to present to their students. So this, you know, the very first time I gave the talk was in January 2018 when I first started teaching. And by November 2018, I, I presented the talk at uh, the B-Sides Dallas-Fort Worth conference here local to me. And so the, the talk I've gave since then and then became a book. So this is an area I'm passionate about. And today our focus is more about how to get experience in pen testing. Just like a lot of, a lot of other areas of cybersecurity, it's hard to get jobs without experience. But the one thing is about offensive security we have a lot of opportunities here that some other areas don't have, and we're going to discuss those. So to kind of share with you my, my offensive security path, and even before the sysadmin, I got interested in, in being a sysadmin from being a, a CAD drafter. I was doing AutoCAD, and I worked for places that worked for an architect. I worked for a company that made steel frame buildings. I worked for a company that, that did electronic security systems for prisons. Uh, let's see, I worked for um, a company that made fiber grate uh, infrastructure for areas that couldn't, that, that metal was too corrosive to be in those environments. So during that time, I found out about sysadmin work and it seemed a lot more interesting. And during that time, I taught myself how to build computers and also took a Novell Netware network operating system course. Some people uh, may have not heard of that, but back like in the time I got into IT back in the late 90s, uh, Novell Netware was the popular uh, network operating system. So uh, that was very popular. So I took a 90-day course, it's a certification course for the, uh, the CNE certification. And then I got my first job on a Netware 411 Windows 95 rollout. And so started as a sysadmin and as what I've done through my career is I went into areas that was interesting to me. So I did the sysadmin thing. Uh, I've been doing that role for about six years. I got interested in, in cybersecurity. So in 2004, after about six years of being a sysadmin, I moved into the network security team. At the time uh, in the organization, we were, we were doing the same thing. Everyone did network security. Everyone did intrusion detection. Everyone did firewall administration. We did risk assessments, we did some vulnerability scanning. And the CISO came into the company, he divided us up into different areas. So I got put in application security and application security is where I found out about pen testing. We were using AppScan to do our web application vulnerability scans. I got to go to different vendor talks on their products and I found out about pen testing. So this was really, uh, you know, I'd seen that was something I wanna do. So in 2012, I got laid off from my job of 14 years. And through that experience in application security, I realized that pen testing was what I wanted to do next. So one of the things I want you to pay attention to here, uh, look at my background and I became a pen tester. So I interviewed for a job with a company consulting as a pen tester and I got the job. How I got the job was my enthusiasm and passion that I displayed for the hiring manager on how passionate I was about learning and how passionate I was about pen testing, how I wanted to get into that role. I told him about my home lab. That's something to remember here. Uh, so he saw my passion, willingness to learn, and that I had a home lab. And this was enough for him to hire me. So I really wasn't, I really didn't have the qualifications per se for that. 
that role. I had the background technology wise, but I didn't have the pen testing piece. I'd run some vulnerability scanners, but he, he took a chance on me. And this was because, like I said, my passion and I had a home lab. So kind of remember these things when you're, you know, trying to get into your next role or trying to get into your pen testing job. And so what is pen testing? So a lot of you here probably know, but we're going to go through kind of my what, how I describe it. Uh, pen testing is assessing security from an adversarial perspective using hacking tools and techniques, also known as ethical hacking. So ethical hacking is an easier way to, to uh, explain to people pen testing because a lot of times over my career, people have asked me, what do you do for a living? You tell them I'm a penetration tester. They have no idea what that means. So ethical hacker just kind of sums it up a little bit better. So that's one of the, the terms it's re referred to. So the experience you need as a pen tester, some of the things you're gonna need here, uh, and this is, this is assuming that you've got a background in you know, understanding networking, uh, understanding operating systems, you know, even if you understand applications. So one of the things about getting into pen testing is leverage your background of things you know how to do. So you may think, you know, red team sounds interesting, but if you're a developer, your pivot point in is going to be web app pen testing because you've been a developer, you understand that area a lot better. And so, you know, that's a good way to start. Once you get into pen testing, you can move into different areas and you can specialize as well. So the tools you need to know, the experience that you need, and, and these can be, and we're going to discuss some ways you can get this experience, even without an actual pen testing job, is you need to know vulnerability scanners like Nessus and Nexpos. And OpenVos is a free one. You can get like a free version of Nessus, Nessus Essentials. So, you know, set up your home lab and use Nessus Essentials to, to scan your network because once you learn Nessus Essentials, you'll be able to use Ness, Nessus Professional. And that's widely used in consulting and a lot of uh, different organizations. So that's a good one to know. Once you learn Nessus, then you can learn Qualys or Rapid7's Nexpost. So pen testing distros like Kali Linux and Parrot OS. You can install tools on, on Ubuntu using the pen tester framework. But one of the things I like about Kali Linux and Parrot OS, a lot of those tools are pre-installed or easily installed. Some try, times trying to install them from scratch can be, you know, can be troublesome and not work out for you. So sticking with those distributions is good. Uh, pen testing tools, just to name a couple, you know, that you really need a lot of experience with is Nmap and Metasploit but there's a lot of other tools that come on Kali Linux and Parrot OS that you need to learn how to use and, and learn to use a variety of tools. Don't just be dependent on just one. And so, uh, you know, as you are learning these tools, these are things that you can, that you can use when you're going through an interview. These are some skills that you can put on your resume. So web app pen testing tools like Burp Suite, OWASP Zap, and different web application vulnerability scanners like Acunetics, AppScan, and WebInspect or some popular ones to just name name a few. So knowing these are important. So when I was getting in, uh, this was like one of the areas that I had some experience with. I knew Linux and I had experience with vulnerability scanners. And so skills. So networking and operating systems, Windows and Linux. So these, these uh, operating system skills, you need at a sysadmin level. So you need to be able to understand this like a sysadmin. And why you need those functions is if you you get a shell or a command line to your target system, then if you can shut down the firewall or run different commands, do administrative uh, tasks, then it's going to make your jo job a lot easier. If you don't understand the operating system and you get a shell to a system, you're going to be doing a lot of Googling, which, you know, there's cases that that's needed and, and you will do that because it's impossible to know everything. And so, but you want that base level of knowledge and, uh, like I said, you get that get, get command line access or a shell to a system, be able to navigate that's gonna be very helpful. Knowing the different Linux and Windows commands, knowing PowerShell, and then hacking and pen testing experience. So these are, these are helpful. So when I started my career, this was the area I was missing, the hacking and pen testing. So one of the first things I did, I was doing some research before I started the job, uh, is Verizon that I went to work for. And prior to getting the job, there was, they were acquiring uh, Terramark, which is a cloud uh, host, a cloud hosting company. And so they were acquiring that company. And so it put off the hiring process. So I talked to them in November 
and didn't get to go to work until March. So I did some research and I found some courses. And one of the first ones I found and in, in certifications that was really respected was the OSCP. And so I knew this was a way to learn how to hack. So I started taking the OSCP. So that's where I got those skills. And then reverse engineering. These are really good skills to have because if you, you know, you get a, a Java jar file or some other compiled code, if you can decompile it, you may be able to find hard coded credentials in there and get access to a system. I've done numerous pen tests where uh, it may not have been a web app pen test and found like a Java jar file or, you know, even an APK file for a mobile mobile device and was able to reverse engineer it and get credentials. The, and a really good uh, pen tester for my local community. And uh, actually, Leslie knows as well. He was one of the people responsible for figuring out how to hack the door lock that her former landlord wanting to, wanted to put all the tenants' uh, door locks, uh, Chase Dartman, he started out as a reverse engineer. So these skills you have, knowing how to code, knowing how to reverse engineer, these are very helpful in, in pen testing. And even coding is good skills. Although you don't need the coding skills to get started as a pen tester, it's very helpful. Bill, write your own scripts. When you see some of these people that are really, really sharp individuals in the industry, just like uh, Byte Bleeder that works for Black Hills Information Security Group, you know, he wrote the crack map exec tool. And so these people like that can write tools that there may have not been something to do what they needed to do and they create it. So, you know, start out learning how to script and then you can get into full blown coding, but you don't necessarily have to have that experience to get started in pen testing. So don't wait to master coding before you get started. So how to get experience. So this is the, the probably the part that most people are interested in. And one of the things, uh, that I've been recommending over the years. And when I started teaching, you know, I was trying to think of ways, how can my students get experience? Because that's a lot of the biggest factor. You know, if you're, if you're in college, make sure to go through an internship program. If you get an internship, you're going to have a lot better chance getting hired on full-time. Sometimes through the employer, you do your internship through, and sometimes just having that 90 days experience. Now you have experience where you didn't. So I would, was sharing different ways with my students and, and I, you know, I've been sharing about bug bounty. I found out about bug bounties because I'd followed Jason Haddix, you know, for years. I followed him on Twitter and I saw some of the different cool techniques he used. He was, you know, he started out as a pen tester and then went to work for bug crowd and did a lot of stuff for bug bounty community uh, education, showing people how to do certain things and just following some of the cool techniques that he had was helpful on my web app pen tests. And so when bug crowd started their ambassador program, I saw that as an opportunity. I could learn more about bug bounty. I could learn how to do the bug bounties and how to share that with the people I mentor, teach, and and speak to at conferences. So that was one of the one of the recommendations I made, and I got kind of affirmation to that confirmation to that back last summer when I was interviewing for jobs. I interviewed with a a very well known boutique pen testing firm, and the hiring manager told me that it was easier for him to find web app pen testers because of bug bounty. So this is not to discourage you of trying to get into web app pen testing. This just means that that's a known way and that, that hiring manager respects that. And so he sees someone with bug bounty experience, then that's going to be someone he'd be interested in interviewing and possibly hiring. So bug bounties, uh, if you're not familiar with bug bounties, I'm sure you've heard of them, but it's basically a crowdsourced pen test. So instead of having one person testing an application, you could have tens or hundreds of thousands of people testing one app. And pen tests are really limited by the number of time, the amount of time you have to test. So if you have a lot of testers, then you're going to uncover things that you may not other, otherwise be able to test. A typical web application, you may have 40 hours to do the pen test and write the report. Whereas with you know a bug bounty, you've got like a, a you know a lot of people putting in a lot of hours in a short period of time. So so this is one of the things that's even good to include with your your pen testing. And some companies also have bug bounty programs in addition to their pen testing programs. And when you get the experience with Bug Bounty, you can also get to do pen tests through them, like HackerOne and Bug Crowd. They also offer pen tests outside of the Bug Bounty, which Bug Bounty, you're paid for the bugs you find, the vulnerabilities, whereas pen testing, you're paid for the pen test. And that was one of the hardest things for me to really get too involved into Bug Bounty was because I can do side pen tests and I get paid for my efforts. Whereas bug bounty, you don't, but bug bounty is good because you get the experience. But these companies offer like bug crowd has their next gen pen test where they perform a pen test and a bug bounty at the same time. 
And so I got to do one of the very first ones and kind of helped be an ambassador for Bug Crowd. And so it was a really cool process. It was like a 30 hours or so that you pen tested and made $1,500, which is really good money uh, for someone starting out. As you get experience, you can make more money. So as you do this, get that experience, you're able to go interview somewhere else and work, go to work full time as a pen tester. So HackerOne and Bug Crowd both offer these pen tests. Typically, if you have pen testing experience, you can interview and get into that process. But if you're not, start out with the bug bounties. As they see you progressing, and you'll get invited to private bug bounties where you have an opportunity to make uh, a better opportunity to make money because there's less people on the bug bounties. You also get invited to do these pen tests. So once you get that pen test experience, you got that. And so you have like these companies that are kind of describe themselves as pen test as a service. So like Cobalt and Synac, and these are a little more difficult to get in. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to have experience, but with like Synac, if you go to uh, to hack the box, they have the Dante challenge as well as the uh, the Synac Red Team track that you go through there, and then that gets you kind of expedited to get interviewed sooner with Synac. So this is like you're not having to have professional experience, just the experience you're getting in these labs. And then like Cobalt, you interview with them, they give you a technical challenge, they'll give you like a vulnerable application to do a pen test against to get your skill level. And then that gets you in, in, into the interview process and gets you in there. So once you're doing the, the pen test phase, like through Bug Crowd or doing this through Cobalt and Synac, then you're getting transferable experience to become a pen tester. You know, this may take, you know, a year or so, depending on you and, and you know, your how well you do interviewing and, and uh, getting uh, approached by recruiters. But after you do this for a while, you're getting experience. As you're doing this, uh, you also get to... Um, as you're, doing, you're getting the experience. So the things you gain from the experience, you're going to be able to do on a technical interview, like with the web app pen testing stuff, you're always going to get asked, whether it's web app pen testing or not, you're going to get asked uh, questions from the OWASP top 10. So know those, know those vulnerabilities and know how to remediate those. And so that's going to help you in an interview. The stuff you learn from the bug bounties and uh, the pen tests through like Cobalt and Synac is going to help give you experience so you can you know you can describe your methodology you use the different tools you're able to describe that to the hiring manager so these are things that's going to help you get a chance to get in and get a job so other areas and these are ways to build your hacking skills ctfs hack the box try hack me uh, home labs using vulnerable vms you can go to volnhub download some vulnerable vms from there pro bono pen testing for nonprofits so ctfs you know like here in a lot of other conferences, they host CTFs. And some companies will, even like Raytheon ran a CTF at, I believe, B-Sides uh, Austin a few years ago. One of our really good pen testers and hackers from our local community solved it in a pretty quick time. And I think the, the part of the goal of them running the CTF was to try to recruit talent. So CTFs at conferences, it's a good way to get noticed. If you're in college, do National Cyber League because they have like a ranking system. And if you rank highly, you'll get approached by hiring managers. And so all these things you're doing, you're getting hacking experience. And then so like try hack me, this is a little more education based and hack the box is kind of a chat. You go in there and you learn how to hack. They've got like active directory environments. And so the, while building a home lab is a good thing, but you can save a lot of time and, and just depend on someone else's skills to build out a, a environment to hack in, like hack the box and try hack me. Hack the Box is getting a little more educational, following the lead of Try Hack Me, but Try Hack Me has a lot of educational stuff to get you up and running. Uh, and then the home labs, I would recommend downloading Metasploitable 2 and 3. You need to know how to hack with Linux. So uh, Metasploitable 2 runs on Ubuntu and Metasploitable 3 can be run on Windows. So you need to be able to hack in both those environments. And so pro bono pen testing works. So if you know any churches or other religious organizations, nonprofits, even some small businesses that can't afford pen tests, you know, you may have relatives that own a small business. You can volunteer to do a pen test for them. You know, if you have someone that that writes, you know, Android or iOS apps, you can pen test those applications to get experience through that. So start out free, then maybe you can do low cost. So once you, you're doing pen testing, the pro bono work, you're still going to get the experience, but 
once you can maybe start making a little money, then you're getting paid to do that. So this shows that, you know, a little more that you're doing it for a job, not just the skill set, but also the professional experience. And so, um, yeah, just to kind of wrap up the first part of my talk is, yeah, just remember to, you know, get those hacking skills, do your CTFs, uh, hack the box, try hack me. You know, as you're doing that, make sure you're documenting using a well-documented methodology. The penetration testing execution standard is a great reference. So learn the steps in that, write up your formal methodology and practice those methodologies. Use like the OWASP testing guide for web app pen testing and have that methodology down. So when you're going through that interview, you can tell someone how you're performing a pen test because, you know, methodology is a big part of that. So the next part of my talk here is hacking health. So this is really, this talk inspired me from uh, the pandemic and just kind of the way I dealt with things. You know, it's really hard mentally for a lot of people. Uh, during the pandemic, I, you know, went, we, a lot of us at where I worked at was going through some really stressful times. We had a management change and we made a lot of life really stressful for a lot of us. Uh, you know, around March, we all started working from home. And, you know, I have like a, you know, kind of a bad relationship with food. When when I was a child, like a lot of people from my generation, my mom would make it, you know, you can't get up from the table unless you eat all your food. So we would sit there and and have to sit at the table to eat all our food. I kind of got better about it because, you know, just an easy way to get out of being in trouble. But my poor brother, you know, he was kind of a smaller kid and he just is a poor guy would sit there for a long time because he just wouldn't get the food down. And then, you know, I was eating all my food and then my mom would guilt me if I didn't eat more, eat seconds and thirds, you know, you're not going to eat any more than that. And so I just kind of got trained to overeat. And so over the years, kind of one of my coping mechanisms is food. If I'm upset or depressed, I'll eat. If I'm upset, sometimes my diet or healthy eating is out the window and I just have to learn to adjust and get back to that. So kind of my health and fitness background is I'm a competitive powerlifter. I've been competing since, since 1984 with some breaks in there. I've competed like in, I think something like over 50 powerlifting competitions, have a world championship. I've got, I've uh, held state and national records. And I have some records that are still in place. I've competed at the Arnold Sports Festival. And I've, I've really been interested in nutrition over the years. One of my first nutrition books was the Nutrition Almanac. And I got interested in nutrition when I started lifting weights when I was 15. Uh, when I was in middle school, you know, I was fairly naturally strong, but I didn't look like it. So I we used to go in the, the weight room during uh, off, off season athletics and just work out. We would lift, you know, back then kids didn't know how to work out. We're just in the gym you know, trying to see how much we could lift and no one believed me how much I could bench press. So over the summer, I decided I was going to start working out. So uh, I would look like I, I worked out. So that's when I got interested in nutrition, started taking supplements, uh, you know, mainly to, to get stronger. It wasn't so much for health at that time. Uh, you know, protein, we had like a, a distributor coming one time and sold protein to our football team. And so this so that was really kind of my experience with nutrition. And I read different diet books and followed things like in Muscle and Fitness Magazine, trying to learn more about nutrition to be able to get bigger and stronger. And so that's really where, you know, that got me interested in, in diet and exercise. And along the way, you know, kind of uh, powerlifting has kind of helped me avoid probably some ser more serious health issues. Uh, in 2003, I was diagnosed with type two diabetes. And a lot of this was a side effect of overeating, uh, you know, towards the end, when I was married to my first wife, I got out of working out, got overweight and unhealthy. And then, you know, uh, took me a while to get back into the gym and take care of my health. But this period of time where I was still eating, you know, these extra calories and stuff, part of it was from being a powerlifter. But one of the things that powerlifting did is it allowed me to overeat and not put on too much fat and stay semi-healthy. But once I quit, you know, I went back, you know, before I even lifted, I was overeating. So powerlifting kind of helped. And it's, and it's one of the things helped me over the years. And one of the things I know I have to do 
to continue to stay healthy, even at my age of 55, I still have to continue to do that. So this kind of helps me and then taking supplements to kind of help me. These are things that help my health being worse than what they are. If, if I didn't do those things, I would probably be a lot less healthy than, than what I am. So during my uh, career as a power lifter, back around 2004, I found out about ketogenic and low carb diets. So I ate low carb diets. And prior to that, when I was to kind of take a step back, when I was diagnosed with type two diabetes, I kind of did, you know, what most people said to lose weight. I just cut calories. I ate less fat, less carbs. Wasn't really doing particularly low carb, but wasn't really doing low fat either. Just kind of cutting back and I lost weight. I went from starting out probably about 260 or so, and then got down about 220 pounds and started lifting. And one of the things that's been bad about powerlifting for me is if you want to get stronger, get heavier. And it doesn't matter how you put the weight on. I mean, that's just the sad fact about it. If you put on, you know, 20 pounds, you're going to be able to squat and bench press more. It just happens. You put on weight and you'll put on some muscle. It may not be all muscle, but, and so over the years, I've been careful about losing weight because once I started losing weight, losing strength, then, you know, you really didn't like that. And you'd, I'd eventually gain the weight back. So keto and low carb is what I kind of found out through, uh, found through my years of powerlifting from about 2004 and on. And uh, so for years, I've been a natural uh, health enthusiast and nutritional supplement enthusiast. Uh, you know, one of the things from my poor eating over the years, it, probably the first health issue I had was in 97, I had gout, something I still will deal with today. And that was because of my overeating and the, the way I ate. So I found a cherry fruit extract, you know, these pills that are dehydrated cherry fruit, and I would use that for my gout. So ever since then, I've been a big fan of natural supplements. Back, I used to have some joint issues and I took glu glucosamine and that helped for that. So I've been a big fan of it. I mean, if you need to take prescription drugs for, for things, definitely do that. And I fought that for years with blood pressure, but there's ways around it, but make sure that you are taking care of your health before you, you know, go that route. You know, I finally got on blood pressure medication to take care of that. And for me, if I do start getting more serious about my cardio, I could probably reverse that. But uh, so, yeah, there's things you can do. I mean, just doing things like taking vitamin D3, that's good for your immune system and vitamin C. Those are things, two things that I always do. And I rarely get sick. Whenever I start getting sick, I take a little more vitamin C and that helps. So I really do that to help with my immune system. And when you're getting your blood test done, get like your vitamin D3 levels. I mean, because vitamin D is like, real, you know, low vitamin D levels have been, uh, you know, kind of associated with cancer and other diseases. And, you know, just getting outside and getting, not telling you to go out and tan, but just getting outside and getting natural vitamin D, getting your, your body synced with the circadian, circadian rhythms is going to help you. That is, you. When you stay in a house too long and, and that unnatural light, you kind of throw things off. You end up staying up late and all that. So getting out into nature is going to help there. So my weight loss and diet history, we kind of covered some of that. Uh, so I did reduce calorie diet, keto and low carb. In 2014, my mom uh, died from from lung cancer, which metastasized to her brain. Both my parents, I lost to, to cancer from, you know, is basically lung cancer that, that took them. And so in 2014, April, 2014, I really got serious. I thought, you know, I need to be around for my daughter and my family. I really need to take my health more seriously. So I lost weight. I was like 255, started about 255 that year and ended up getting down to like 195 by the end of the year. And so fortunately I, you know, I've kind of, my weight's kind of yo-yoed since then, but it's never got back up to that 250 range. I try to set a range for myself and not go above that. I, could, I call it my fat weight. So now my fat weight is like 203. So if I start getting at 203, then I know I got to cut my carbs back and do things to, to, to lose weight, just to try to stay, stay healthy. You know, in my very competitive powerlifting days, you know, the, the heavier weight didn't bother me, but as you get older, you know, it starts to affect your joints and your ankles and it's just not really worth it. So I decided I wanted the longevity. So that's what, I, you know, so I started focusing on that. So the things I've had the most success with diet wise, you know, I was doing a ketogenic diet in 2014 and from about May to about to May to November, it took me to lose like 55 pounds. And, and the thing about 
ketogenic diets is you're able to lose weight without a lot of activity. So some people, you know, you, it's kind of hard to get activity in because if you're too heavy. And so something like the ketogenic diet can get your weight down to where you can start getting some activity. You know, any kind of activity is helpful. I mean, walking, simply walking is, is good. One of the things being a diabetic, I really notice is the lack of activity and how it affects me. When I was working in an office last year, moving around, I saw an improvement on my blood glucose levels. And that's why I had to start walking. Some of the things I dealt with the pandemic. And so also combined keto, low carb, and intermittent fasting is like the sweet spot for me. This is what really works. When I was doing really well in 2014, I didn't, I would like not eat breakfast and then I would eat lunch and dinner. And so my pandemic experience, like I mentioned, uh, things were really stressful at work and I just really need, and the gym closed, you know, the pandemic lockdown happened, the gym closed. I couldn't get into the gym. That was my way to work out my way to relieve stress. So I had this stress that I wasn't able to relieve by going to the gym. I mean, I've had stressful instances back in the past, you know, where I wasn't working out and the stress built up. I started working out and it helped the stress. So I wasn't getting that stress relief. So what I did during this time, I lost 20 pounds because I was in one of those upward phases before the pandemic. My weight had crept back up to like two, 220. And so uh, what we started doing is we we did, you know, kind of a type of intermittent fast. So what we did is intermittent fasting is, you know, you're, you're, everyone is fasting. So you're, there's times you're eating and times you're not. So the times you're not is when you burn fat. And so what we did and, you know, because for me, it's hard to, as if I'm in stressful situations, it's hard to limit certain foods. So what I did is just eliminated breakfast, uh, ate lunch and had an early dinner. So I was done with my eating before five o'clock. And then we were walking every day, walked for 30 minutes. I think it was like maybe a mile and a half. And as the summer got hotter here in Texas, it gets pretty hot. We walked at night. So I really found a connection with nature. If you see some, see my Instagram or follow uh, me on Twitter, you saw some of the pictures, of the frogs and the rabbits and the owls and different scene, things I've seen. It was kind of like a meditation for me as my way to, to relieve the stress of the day from, from work and you know, the social isolation. I'm a very social person. I love going to meetups. You know, when things are normal, I'm hosting two meetups a month. Uh, the Pwn School Project meetups. I'm going to Dallas Hackers Association, North Texas Cybersecurity Group. Sometimes our local OWASP meetings, uh, our DC 214 group, and things like that. So I didn't have those stress relievers. So the walking really helped me and just the nature, the calmness at night, and, and that really helped. So the walking, just from the exercise perspective, helped me lose the weight. And walking is just really low intensity exercise, something that, that is easy for most people to do. You may have to start out walking shorter distances, uh, walk in areas that there's not very many hills and inclines until you build up your, your strength and, and endurance. And so that was what I was doing. And I lost 20 pounds. I lost 20 pounds from about March until it took me probably about 90, 90 days. It was like three or four months and I've been able to maintain most of that. And I eventually, and during that intermittent fasting, I was eating whatever I wanted to. I really wasn't eating low carb. My wife is an avid cyclist and endurance athlete. She does triathlons. So on Fridays, she would carb load for her ride on Saturday and she would fix these big pasta dinners or lunches and we'd eat all this pasta and I was still losing weight, but I just finally got to the point I had to go back to, to lower carb because although my weight was doing well. I wasn't, my blood glucose levels weren't maintaining very well. So intermittent fasting, everyone is doing this. You may not realize it. We're not eating, you're fasting. And we need these phases. What kind of hurt us back in the eighties is the low carb diet fads come along and eating more. They said, eat snacks in between. And what happened is you're eating all the time. And when you eat, you're, you're increasing your insulin levels. Insulin is a, insulin is a fat storing hormone. So if you're insulin, that's why people that are type two, one diabetic or either type two diabetes have type two diabetes using insulin can't lose weight sometimes until they're able to get weaned off of insulin. So as you're eating all the time, you're storing fat. So a big thing that will help a lot of people is maybe just eat three meals a day. Don't snack in between. And, and that's going to help you, uh, doing things like cutting out a meal, eat two meals a day, 
uh, there's different kind of kind of uh, testing, you know, different fasting windows, and we'll look at some of those here real quick. So intermittent fasting. So you see here. So this is your this is this on the left hand side is the fasting time. On the right hand side is the eating time. And this 16-8 split is usually what most people do by nature. But when you really figure out, you're it's really more like a 15-9 15, 15, or a 13-10. I'll get the right, but yeah. My math's kind of wonky there, but you're usually, it's usually you're eating more hours now. You're usually like nine or 10 hours. So just doing a simple reduction like that will help uh, doing a four hour eating window. So you're only eating for four hours. So you can start eating at noon and then eat until four o'clock and don't eat after that. And the thing is that's interesting with this, sometimes you don't, you don't have to necessarily reduce calories to do the same, to, to get the same effects. So I saw a really good, uh, talk on uh, actually a documentary on Amazon Prime and, that went over uh, fasting. And uh, Dr. Jason Wong was one of the specialists on there. He's a nephrologist, which is a kidney doctor. And uh, he used this because he finally got tired of uh, seeing his patients die. They were, you know, they had diabetes, they were insulin, and they just got out of control. So he started having them do intermittent fasting and fasting. And it helped a lot of people. And one of the things some people see just eating for their circadian rhythms, just eating, you know, during the day instead of eating at night, you know, not eat after five o'clock, just making that change difference, help people getting in sync with the, their circadian rhythms, you know, because the nighttime eating is really where people put on a lot of weight. People may not eat much or snack during the day, but maybe they do at night. So those are some simple things there. So cutting calorie, calories in, calories out is a lot of the, the normal way people talk about losing weight, that does work, but it doesn't take an effect hormones like insulin. It does to effect because you're eating, maybe you're eating less, you're not producing as much insulin, but there's a hormonal effects from the way you eat, like your insulin levels. Uh, reducing calories is, you know, one of the basic concepts of dieting. But one of the things I like with the intermittent fasting is you can keep eating the way you do, just, you know, cutting down that eating window. So exercise, start easy, pick something you can stick with. Simply walking helps. It helped me a whole lot. And where this kind of even surprised me to this day, the experience I have with exercise is the fact that it was something that took this little effort that helped me. I mean, another example is like my father-in-law, he's uh, on the heart transplant list and his heart health improved by doing some very minor, easy uh, workouts and it improved his heart health. So you just don't understand sometimes how much that helps and just basic activity, get up and move around the house each day. If you're working from home, get out, take a little short way, walk, just move around. Don't just sit in the same place. All that activity is cumulative. So you're building up, you know, those steps build up. That's what the, kind of the motivation of the step counters is you're using step counters to track your activity. You're trying to improve activity. So uh, intermittent fasting and just get out there and do some walking, get some light activity. And, and that's what helped me. And I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure to help you, my wife, lost weight from it too. I mean, she's lighter than she was in, in high school. And when we got married and, and basically she was, you know, doing the same thing I was doing. She was just intermittent fasting and walking on top of, she does a lot of cycling. So she had a little more carbs for the, the activity she had to perform, but it worked for her as well. And so I don't know if we have any time for questions or not, but that concludes my, my rant. I mean, my talk. <laughs> Awesome keynote, Phil. There are two questions. Uh, I think we have two minutes. Okay. So the first one is uh, they would love to know how well your students do in the job market. They do pretty well. I think the last, last time I checked, at last count, seven of my students had gotten pen testing jobs. And so not only do I help my students, I'll help other people that I'm connected with on LinkedIn. There's a guy in our local community that I knew from the meetups. And this is why I tell people to network. I knew he was a recent college grad, had a, had a computer science degree and wanted to be a pen tester. I knew someone looking for, for uh, entry-level pen testers. I recommended him. He got his first job. So uh, yeah, so at least seven of my students got jobs as pen testers. And there were several others that got jobs in other areas of cybersecurity. So yeah, it's uh, so it's one of the things I really try to do is I really try to help the students pass educating the students. I try to help them find jobs. Excellent. And then the second question was, is pr protein slash whey powder still vital for weightlifters or has it been changed up? 
it's kind of one of the things that as things have evolved with sports fitness, a lot of times you're trying to keep whey protein around post-workout because there's times insulin levels being raised is good. It can cause, it can, if it stays elevated long or raised at times you don't need it, it can store fat. So whey protein kind of helps uh, raise those insulin levels and it's really anabolic and helps you gain muscle. So whey protein after you work out and then like a casein protein or some kind of uh, plant-based protein during the other times of the day. And after you work out, you've got like a window there where your body is synthesizing protein more. So if you're trying to gain muscle, then within, you know, a few hours after, I forget what, how long the protein synthesis window lasts, but hour, I'd say at least, you know, four hours after that, you're, you're able to simulate protein and use it better than other times. Cause a lot of times you just overeat a protein, you're like overeating food. It's not necessarily going to build muscle. Perfect. Thanks so much, Phil.